Hello everyone and welcome to the Chapter 1 lecture. The first chapter in your Goldman book is titled The Data Communications Industry. So we're going to take you through and show you some of the components now that make up the data communications industry. First off, we're going to take a look at a couple of things that you should think about with regards to your approach to data communications. First you will never know all there is to know about data communications. You won't possibly live long enough to be able to acquire all the information that is out there with regards to data communications. And you more than likely will run into somebody in your lifetime who claims to be the guru that knows everything about data communications, but I can pretty much assure you that they are a liar because that is just virtually impossible. This is such a complex field. There is so much information out there, and of course it changes almost on a daily basis. So the main thing is to be honest with yourself uh, as far as what you don't know about data communications. As long as you're always honest about what you do know and you don't know, then you should be fine. If you start trying to fake your way through things, that's when you get into trouble. So what exactly is data communications? Well, the classical definition of data communications is the encoded transmission of data via electrical, optical, or wireless means between computers or network processors. You might want to think of data communications as a foreign language. Just as if you were to attempt to master any foreign language, Data communications also is going to require a lot of practice in speaking and learning the acronyms as well as being able to communicate um, the terminology to other people that uh, you'll eventually be working with in the industry. In some cases, it's helpful for you to form study groups. I know it's a little bit more difficult in an online class. Um, but what I have done for you, as I mentioned during the first night of class, is set up the quizzes for each chapter so that you can repeat them as many times as you'd like. That helps you then to get all of the, uh, the different definitions and, and acronyms and terminology um, presented to you time and time again so that you start becoming more comfortable with uh, what the definitions are of, of all these various terms. So I really encourage you to, to work those quizzes with each chapter. You should be doing them five, six times. Um, per chapter so that you get really comfortable, really familiar with all the terms that uh, do occur in each chapter. Now this diagram is a very simple diagram to identify the various components or stakeholders that make up the data communications industry. To start with we have the ISPs or the Internet Service Providers. Those are the ones that actually provide you with the service to make the connection to the Internet. Um, the next would be our vendors, our consultants, uh, somebody that actually sells us various components that uh, we use in our networks, uh, our consultants that help us to put together and design the various networks. The carriers would be the telecommunication carriers, and of course they're the big players uh, in data communications because they control all of the pathways between the different uh, local area networks that are out there and the internet. And uh, many times these days there also are internet service providers. Manufacturers would be anybody that actually is in the business of producing the products that we use within our networks. Cisco is a big player. They uh, create switches and routers and various components. And, uh, of course, manufacturers of operating systems like Apple and Microsoft also would be included under manufacturers. The next two items here, the residential customers. Most of us have an Internet connection now at our home, so we're considered to be residential customers. And then, of course, at work, you more than likely have an Internet connection as well, so that would represent the business customers. And in both cases, there's all types of equipment, computers and routers and switches that uh, we purchase and we use as part of our data communications. The regulatory agencies would be like the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, at the national level. But there's also regulatory agencies uh, at the county and state, county and city levels as well. Uh, most of your telecommunication carriers, uh, your phone companies, your cable companies, they have some sort of a 
agreement that they have worked out with local agencies to be able to operate within those particular territories. Technology and research, of course, a lot of that comes from the manufacturing area, the development of new products and new technologies to be used in the process of data communications. We'll see a slide a little bit later on that talks about the gap between the, the need for technology and the actual standardization of technology. And part of the development of technology uh, includes the fact that at some point we need to have standards established for these technologies so that a technology developed by one company can interoperate with technologies developed by other companies. And so standards of making organizations are very big. Uh, we'll talk about the OSI uh, model, which is developed for the uh, International Standards Organization, uh, ISO. And then also you'll hear terms like IEEE. Uh, they're big on the electrical components that are used within networking. And um, a lot of other organizations, EIA, TIA, ASCII. And in fact, there's an appendix at the back of your textbook that you might want to take a look at that lists all the various standards-making organizations and gives a brief description of what each one does. And then lastly, we have the judicial and political legislative component of data communications. Um, your legislators, both your state and uh, federal legislators, Congress, are very much involved with the regulation of data communications industry. And as you'll see, too, uh, we'll be talking about uh, a judgment that, that was actually a court case that came down a few years ago that had a big impact on uh, the whole telecommunications industry as well. And so that was uh, the judicial component involved there. And then you put all those together, and of course that is the makeup then of the data communications industry. As I mentioned to you in the last slide, the regulation of uh, the telecommunications, the data communications industry, is uh, a very big part of the whole industry. And so there are two tightly dependent components um, that are in a state of flux all the time, constantly changing, which is the regulatory and the carrier components. So when you hear the terminology carrier, think of telecommunications, regulatory, think of that uh, judicial, political, legislative component that we talked about. So the regulatory component represents your local, state, federal agencies. They're charged with regulating the telecommunication systems. And then the carrier component represents the actual companies, such as the telephone cable companies that actually sell us the transmission services. In order for the telecommunication companies to be able to raise their rates or to expand their territory, they need to establish what are known as tariffs, which are basically a proposal that they submit then to these regulatory agencies. So the tariffs are what are submitted to the state or the federal or local regulatory agency by the carriers. And then the regulatory bodies will then have some sort of a ruling. A lot of times there's public hearings that are involved as well. And they will either approve or disapprove the request that's being made by the telecommunications uh, company. And so this graphic here just represents the cyclic process of the carriers making proposals and the regulatory agencies then making their rulings uh, either in favor of or against those proposals, which obviously affects the business of the carriers themselves. So you want to think of this as a very formal process, um, lots of paperwork and documentation and even some research is being done, as I said many times also, public hearings uh, are also involved in the whole process. So we've been talking about regulation. Uh, this picture here of Judge Harold Green is representative of a incident that occurred in the early 80s, which is referred to as deregulation and divestiture. So two different components going on here. One was deregulating the industry, the telecommunications industry, and then the other was the breakup of uh, AT&T, which was the divestiture uh, portion of that. Um, before deregulation and divestiture, um, our telecommunications needs, which would be our data, voice, hardware, and services, were all supplied, with a few exceptions, by a single vendor, which was AT&T, America uh, 
American Telephone and Telegraph. Homeowners were not allowed to purchase and install their own phones at this time. A lot of you probably never even experienced this. Um, AT&T owned all the equipment that was connected to the public switch telephone network, the PSTN, and customers rented their phones from AT&T, very much like you rent your cable box from the cable company. Um, local operating companies provided local service, but they were all part of the AT&T system. All telephone service was coordinated through one telecommunications organization. Most indoor wiring was also the responsibility of AT&T, whereas these days the phone company is responsible for the wiring up to your uh, point of entry, as it's called, and then you're responsible for the wiring inside of your home or business. Um, the top-to-bottom integration allowed for excellent coordination, interoperability, but also severely limited customer choice. The uh, single company telecommunications industry was viewed as a monopoly, came to an end in the late 70s, early 80s. The initial divestiture and deregulation of the telecommunications industry was not the result of a purely regulatory process. This enormously important event was primarily a judicial process. And it was fought out in the courtrooms, largely. It was fostered by one man, Bill McGowan, who was the former president of MCI. They were an uh, up-and-coming, long-distance company at the time and was felt they weren't able to be competitive in the market uh, due to this monopoly of AT&T. So although the FCC, the Federal Communication Commission, initially ruled in 1971 that MCI could compete with AT&T for long-distance service, it was McGowan's 1974 lawsuit that got the Justice Department involved and then led to the actual breakup of AT&T. AT&T was declared a monopoly, and it was broken into smaller companies known as the RBOCs, the Regional Bell Operating Companies, and that was done through a process that was known as divestiture, as I mentioned earlier, and that was set forth by Federal Judge Harold Green, who you see on your screen there in 1982, when he issued what is known as the MFJ, or the Modified Final Judgment. Uh, Judge Green used it to effectively control the U.S. telecommunications industry until 1996, when the Telecommunications Act expressly ended his control. So this graphic here then shows you the breakup of the AT&T monopoly into smaller pieces into the regional bell operating companies or ROB, RBOCs and again this is prior to the Telecommunications Act of 1996. Um, divestiture broke up the telephone network services of AT&T into several long distance and local service companies. So AT&T retained the right to offer long distance services while the formal local bell operating companies, or BOCs, were grouped into these newer regional bell operating companies, or RBOCs, to offer local telecommunication services. So you had one group of companies offering the local services, the RBOCs, they were offering the local services, and then AT&T AT um, remained to be an entity, um, but they were providing then exclusively uh, long-distance service. So as you look at this graphic here, you can see the RBOCs and their constituent former BOCs after divestiture and through 1996. And so the, each of the uh, area regionals uh, groupings that you see there, they underneath they identify the, the former BOC name. Uh, for instance, like Pacific Telesis Group was formerly Pacific Telephone and, and Nevada Bell. Uh, deregulation introduced an entirely different aspect of the telecommunications industry in the United States. The ability of phone companies in America to compete in an unrestricted manner in other industries, such as computer and information systems fields. Prior to deregulation, phone companies were either banned from doing business in other industries or were subject to having their profits and or rates monitored or regulated in a fashion similar to the way in which their rates for phone service were regulated. Network services offered by phone companies are still regulated. Local service rate proposals are filed as tariffs, as we mentioned earlier, on the state level with a particular state's Public Utilities Commission, 
And the federal level, of course, is the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission for Interstate Service Proposals and Rate Change Requests. These commissions have balance uh, objectives that are sometimes contradictory. Basic phone service must remain affordable enough for all residents of a state. Uh, this guarantee is sometimes known as the universal service or universal access if you're making uh, your income, annual income, is less than a certain amount, then uh, you're still guaranteed to have phone service. Um, phone companies must remain profitable to be able to afford to constantly reinvest in upgrading their physical resources, all the hardware and cabling and buildings, as well as in educating and training their human resources. The divestiture and deregulation activities of the 1980s allowed competing long-distance carriers such as MCI and U.S. Sprint to sell long-distance services on a level playing field with AT&T thanks to a ruling known as equal access. This means that all long-distance carriers must be treated equally by the local regional bell operating companies in terms of access to the local carrier switching equipment and ultimately to their customers. So what this means is that these companies like MCI and U.S. Sprint now are able to actually install their switches, their phone switches, in these RBOC uh, facilities so that the, they can provide um, long-distance service to the local communities. So the next big event then that affected the telecommunications industry was the Telecommunications Act of 1996, which sought to encourage competition in all aspects and markets of telecommunication services, including switched and dedicated um, local and inter-LATA traffic. We're going to take a look at LATAs in the next slide here. Um, also cable TV, also wireless services like paging, cellular, and also satellite services. The legislation directed the FCC to produce the rules that allow for the local exchange carriers, which are known as LECs, and the inner exchange carriers, the ones that connect between the local exchange carriers, or IXCs, to compete in each other's markets. So now the local exchange carriers could compete um, and provide long distance, and the inner exchange carriers could provide local service. So this graphic here then shows you basically the components that make up the public switch telephone network, or PSTN. And so the public switch telephone network is comprised of LATAs, local access transport areas. These were established as a result of the AT&T breakup. And originally they were reserved for the local phone company, or LEC, the local exchange carriers. Uh, recent rulings and legislation have made the distinction between the intra-LATA and inter-LATA calls uh, less significant than they used to be, but the LATA structure is still important to the overall telecommunications architecture. There can be several LATAs per area code, and LATAs can cross state boundaries. Area codes cannot. We'll take a look at another graphic here in just a bit that shows you the comparison between a LATA the local access transport area and area code designation. Uh, residences and businesses are connected to the public switched telephone network by circuits known as the local loop. So that's the wiring that occurs between your business or your household and the CO or the central office of the telecommunications company. Any phone traffic that's destined for locations outside of the local LATA have to be handed off to a long distance or inner exchange carrier, IXC, of the customer's choice. So on your phone bill, you pay your local phone company charges, and then you also have a long distance carrier charge as well. Competing long distance carriers wishing to do business in a given LATA maintain a switching office in that LATA known as a POP or a point of presence. And so you can see in this graphic here the little building with the POP underneath of it there. So the local loop, again, is between the home and the business to the central office of the telecommunication system, the phone company, and then the phone company will provide long distance through whichever carrier the subscriber chooses. And so that long distance carrier then is going to have a, a facility 
within the LADA to make the connection to the CO and then also a connection then that connects interlata to another POP that's located in a different LADA somewhere else in the region. Um, POPs handle billing as well as routing between the LADAs and the circuit may be via either satellite, microwave, fiber optic cable, traditional wiring, or some combination of all of those. So this is the graphic I was saying that we'd be viewing that we're going to compare the LADA to area codes. So again, remember that you can have many LADAs within a single area code. Area codes cannot cross state boundaries, whereas LADAs can. Um, basically, LADA is just a designated service area region. Um, the area code is restricted by the actual number of people that use the particular service. If you think about how the phone numbering system works, you have the prefix and then you have the local four digit number and so there's only um, 999999 from 000000 up to 999999 uh, as far as the available numbers, the combination of numbers uh, that we could possibly have within a given area code. So what happens is when all those phone numbers get used up, then they have to split the area code into two separate area codes so that we have now more phone numbers available in a particular area code. So the, the LADA, again, is just a service region. It identifies that a particular company is uh, given permission to uh, provide service to these residents, and the area codes are the actual numbers, uh, phone numbers themselves, that are available. So again, as you get more higher density of population or you get lots of industry and businesses within a local area and more and more phone numbers and, and of course cell numbers these days are taking up a lot of the phone numbers. So the more and more phone numbers that are being utilized within a particular region, um, that's what is, is determining the actual area code and whether it needs to be broken up. Many of you that have lived in Southern California for a long time, you probably have experienced the several breakups of area codes. I know that when I was younger, the area code here was 714, and then uh, they split the 714 area code up into 714 and 909, and uh, I was in the 909 at that time, and then not too long ago, they divided up 909 and uh, split it off to 951. And I know they've done that several times in the San Diego area and also in the L.A. area, um, again, because of the need, the necessity to have an increased availability as far as the number of phone numbers that are uh, usable. So this graphic here then just shows you the larger picture of the state of California and how it is organized into LADAs. Again, these different areas, these regional areas of, of operations, uh, when this graphic was created, AT&T had not absorbed uh, Southern Bell at that point in time, and so this was actually a representation of the Southern Bell Company's um, LADA areas, LADA operating areas. And if you look closely at that state of California there, notice that between the numbers 5 and the number 6, there's an area that doesn't have a number assigned to it and that is where GT&E operated for a number of years. That includes uh, Temecula, Menifee, uh, Palm Springs, and that general region there, which was always serviced by GTE. And, uh, of course, they become Verizon. And so that was the one little area within the state of California that was not actually being serviced by the uh, Southern Bell companies. And so this graphic here then just shows nationally all of the area codes that are available within the United States. Of course, again, this graphic was created um, a few years back, and so there's been several changes to many of the higher, higher populated areas, um, New York and L.A., um, Southern California, I guess, in general. So this map is not 100% uh, up to date. If you look in the front of your telephone book, you, you can uh, find the, the current map that uh, gives you the latest area code designations. This slide here is showing a graphic that 
deals with how standards lag behind the actual development of technology itself. So as you think about it, um, companies come up with a new idea, a new technology that they're going to develop, and they have that technology ready to go to market long before the standards organizations have actually established a standard for that technology because it takes them a while to review the technology that has been uh, created by a particular manufacturer. And as you learn about standard bodies, what you'll learn is that they're basically made up of uh, employees of all the various manufacturers. So it depends on which standards body that we're talking about, which manufacturers would be members. But then all of these members have input into what is going to be a finalized standard. And the idea of a standard then, again, is to take a particular technology and make sure that it will interoperate with all the different products that are released by uh, other companies that are out there. USB uh, is a good example of that. You can buy a, a USB product that is from one manufacturer and you can plug it into a USB port on just about any computer and it, you know the, the components should interact and work appropriately with each other. So that's due to the fact that, that standards have been established uh, for that particular technology. And so if you look closely again at this graphic, again, it's just showing you kind of a timeline of here's the standard being developed, getting it ready for market. I should say the technology being developed, getting it ready for market. And then later on, we see the actual standard being developed. And then usually after that standard is developed, then we get a introduction of a second generation of the technology. So you know, again, USB, a great example there. We had USB 1.1. Now we have USB 2.0. And so this slide here then just gets into the importance of standards. Obviously, without standards, data communications would be nearly impossible. Um, we wouldn't have development of as many products, most likely, and we wouldn't have competitive pricing. So standards allow multiple vendors to manufacture competing products. That helps to drive price down, allows us to get a larger array of products out there in the marketplace. Uh, the idea is then that all of these competing products will work together effectively. And users then, that's us, we can be confident that the devices will operate as specified and will interoperate successfully. Standards do have a tremendous potential economic impact on the vendors. So this is a simple list of the steps involved in creating a new standard. The first step would be the recognition of the need for a standard. So particular technologies becoming popular. Um, you know, a lot of technologies get developed and really kind of fizzle out, and so they don't become used widely within uh, business or uh, purchased by consumers. And so there's really never a need for a particular standard on that technology to be created. But uh, once we identify the fact that there is a technology that is taking off that a lot of people are going to use, then that would be the recognition then that uh, there is a need for a standard to be created. So then the next step is to form some sort of a committee or a task force. These are the people that will analyze the technology and uh, help to develop what the various standards for the technology will be. So that third phase then is that actual collection of the information and going through making recommendations and whatnot. Then at uh, the fourth step we have a tentative uh, standard identified. Sometimes there's even alternative standards. A lot of times um, you might even read about it in the trade magazines that uh, a particular standard is, is not being issued because there is uh, some sort of a alternative standard that is still being debated by the standards body. Um, but eventually they'll resolve which standard is going to be the best and um, it is then issued finally as a standard. Um, but only after step five, which is where we get the feedback uh, on the standard. So what happens is this task force basically releases a document that says, well, here's the standard that we're planning on releasing, and then they're asking for feedback from the rest of the uh, committees and, or I should say, uh, members of the standards body.
and at that point in time that's kind of the, where the debate is taking place and so once all that's been resolved then the final standard is being issued and uh, the idea from that point forward would be that all new products that are developed by manufacturers would be compliant with whatever the final standard was that was developed by the standards committee. So this slide again just shows uh, many of the components that make up the data communications industry and the fact that uh, within each of these fields there are always emerging trends and uh, there's always whatever the current status is of a particular technology and so that's two areas that are always in flux within each of these communities. Um, and then in the very center there you see that we have supply and demand and so demand really is what is always initiating new technologies to be developed and so once the demand has been created then the manufacturers start producing and then of course that's to meet the uh, supply side of that puzzle. This is a graphic that uh, they use from time to time in the Goldman book that uh, kind of takes things from a business perspective um, since business really is the motivation for uh, most of product development and, and application development that goes on out there. So that's as you can see the bullet there says business needs drive solutions. And so initially we have various requirements by a business that need to be fulfilled and the end result is we need to then provide as IT professionals, we want to provide solutions then for those business requirements. And so you can see it's kind of a, a cyclic process here. Uh, business then determining uh, applications that need to be generated. Uh, the applications themselves are going to create some sort of data. The data then needs to be transmitted over a network. And so some sort of technology is going to be involved here in the collection of the data, in the uh, moving of the data around through the network and of course storage is going to be an aspect of that as well. And so again on the solution side there's going to be a technology that is going to work over the network, it's going to involve the creation and transmission of the data, it's going to interact with an application, and it's going to provide some sort of a solution to a business requirement. Interfaces are also a big aspect of data communications. These are the three different types of interfaces that you will ever run into. Hardware to hardware interface, software to software interface, or a software to hardware interface. And so let's start at the top with hardware to hardware interface. In this particular case what they're showing you is a serial cable which has uh, a number of wires that are inside of the cable capable of carrying electricity and we want to somehow integrate that uh, wire and the, the electrical current that's flowing down that wire with this piece of equipment on the right here, uh, more than likely a computer in this case, a very simplified graphic of a computer. Um, but the solution in this particular case, or the interface I should say in this particular case, is what we call a DB25 interface and so that means that all of the wires in the cable get connected to the pins in the DB25 interface and because the DB25 interface is a standardized interface then it uh, is very easy for component manufacturers to uh, purchase the DB25 interface for creating ends on cables or termination point you can call that too on a cable uh, for creating connection points uh, on the computer as well uh, you'll find them on routers and, and switches and the like and so because we have the same type of interface there to take the the electrical uh, flow the current off of the wire we can then have it flow inside of the computer and then of course the computer is going to do some sort of processing with that electrical current. The software to software interface, uh, this is showing us how we can translate data that's stored in a proprietary format in one application and have it converted over to another application's format so that it can understand it and display it correctly. So in this case here they're showing a chart that was created in Excel and Excel of course is a Microsoft product and it stores that chart information in a proprietary format. 
And so there's a interface called OLAY, which stands for Object Linking and Embedding, and it's built into um, most operating systems, and it gives us the capability then to take this this chart, which is stored in one format, created by Excel, and then having it translated into the format that Word understands, so that Word can then also display the chart in a Word document. So that's a software-to-software -software interface, OLAY, object linking embedding being the, the software interface there. It's a translation from one format to another format. And then finally we see the software-to-hardware format. In this case it's a driver. The software is uh, the NDIS driver, which is the network driver interface specification. And so the idea being that the operating system needs to be able to commute, communicate with the network card, which is a piece of hardware. And so the network card, its job is to um, package up frames that it sends out over the network in electronic or optical format and also to receive electrical and optical signals coming in and identify uh, the, the textual components that are inside of the frames that come in over the network. So all that data that the network card is either sending or receiving has to somehow be able to interoperate then with our operating system. And so it's the uh, driver that is doing that for us. Now, one of the big aspects of this particular presentation is the fact that in the early days, the network card manufacturer actually had to write different drivers depending on what hardware platform they were making the card for, depending on what operating system that would be running on that platform. And so it was very complicated for them and time consuming for them to have to write all these different drivers for different operating systems and also different protocols as well. Um, you had the NetWare protocol, you had IP, TCP IP, you had Apple Talk, and so all these different protocols were operating. And there were different types of networks. Uh, they weren't always Ethernet networks. We had token ring networks. We had ArcNet networks. And so it was, it was just a big burden for network manufacturers to have to write all these drivers. And so NDIS was a solution to that. Um, the, the idea being that the network card manufacturer just writes to this NDIS specification, and then the driver itself um, will translate to whatever particular operating system, whether it be on a, an Apple Mac or a Linux system or a Windows system. So um, it, it just makes it a gives a gives a standard, um, you know, just one component. Uh, one format that the network card manufacturer has to be able to translate the data into that one format then can be utilized by all these different operating systems and so that's what allows the the OS to communicate with the network card without a, a lot of extra programming by the network card manufacturer going on. Now, when it comes to networking, the biggest single standard that is out there is what is known as the OSI model. OSI stands for Open Systems Interconnect, and it was developed by the ISO standards body. The ISO is the International Standards Organization. So the ISO developed this framework for organizing network technology and organizing the protocols uh, into what is called the OSI model or Open Systems Interconnection Network Reference Model, to be very specific about it. So the OSI model takes this big complex concept of networking and it breaks it down into smaller chunks, the idea being that it's easier to focus on the smaller chunks than it is on this big, huge concept of networking. So the OSI model consists of seven layers and those seven layers then loosely group the functionality requirements for communication between two computing devices. This OSI model is one that you're going to be focused on quite a bit in this course. In fact, uh, one of your skills exams is going to be on the various components of the OSI model. You're going to need to know the seven layers. You're going to need to know the order of the layers, which is always the same from top to bottom. Um, you're going to need to know the protocols that operate at the layers. And so as we go through the, the book, we'll be focusing a lot on the OSI model. Uh, the power of the OSI model is uh, the fact that it's a, an open standard, which means that it's not owned by one particular company. Uh, 
So any manufacturer can easily go and, and look up this standard, the ISO standard 7489, and it defines the uh, that loose grouping we were talking about, uh, the various protocols and what the functionality is that's been defined for each layer, uh, the seven layers of the OSI model. So it's used to organize, define protocols uh, that are involved in communicating between two computing devices located in the same room as effectively as two devices that are located on the opposite sides of the world. Um, another terminology that we see here quite a bit is protocol, so you need to start understanding what a protocol is. A protocol is really just a piece of software, but think of it as a uh, method, or really what it is is the rules that govern a communication process. So think of the fact that I'm speaking to you in English and there are rules of the English language and that's why you can understand, you've learned those rules of the English language so you understand the language that I'm speaking. If, if I was speaking to you in French and you didn't know French then obviously you and I would not be able to communicate. So protocols, as long as two computers are using the same protocols at a particular layer of the OSI model, they should be able to effectively uh, communicate with each other because they understand the rules of that communication process at that given layer. It is, as the final bullet point says here, the reference mode in the world of telecommunications. And of course that includes data communications as well. I spent a little more time on the last slide on protocols than I needed to. I forgot this was slide was coming up. Uh, but here again you can see a protocol is a set of rules governs the communication between hardware and or software components. There are many well known as well as a few obscure protocols that are used in telecommunications. TCP IP is a good example of a suite of protocols. TCP is one protocol and IP is another protocol so we often refer to that grouping of protocols as the TCP IP protocol suite. And those are just two of, of many protocols that uh, we'll be covering when we talk about TCP IP later on in the course. So this slide is an overview of the OSI model and you can see the seven layers listed on the left there starting at the bottom. Layer number one is the physical layer. Layer number two is the data link layer. Layer number three, network layer. Four, transport layer. Five is the session layer. 6, presentation layer, and 7 is the application layer. Now I want you to notice the pink bar right here which shows the separation between the hardware and the software portion of the OSI model. So these first two layers, the physical and the data link layer, these all are referring to, will consist of components that exist in your network card. So like the physical connection to your network card, is it uh, Ethernet, is it uh, token ring? And then the data link layer, which is the component that does the framing of the data before it's converted into electricity or light and sent out onto the network. Um, the data link layer is also built into the network card. In fact, one of the key components that we talk about a lot in uh, data communications is the fact that each message that gets sent out uses what is called a MAC address to identify what network card sent the message and what network card received the message. So notice that the MAC or Media Access Control sublayer is part of the data link layer. It's the bottom sublayer of the data link layer. So the data link layer actually has these two sublayers, the MAC sublayer and the LLC or logical link control sublayer. So this MAC address, which is a 12-digit uh, hexadecimal value that is unique to each network card that is manufactured, it is actually a value that's burned into a chip on the network card itself. So that unique address, the MAC address, is actually originating at the network card. Later on we'll show you how it gets added to the beginning of a frame to identify the source of the message if we're sending and then also we'll uh, use it as a destination address so that we can identify uh, 
who we want to send a message to or which device, network card, interface. We'll, we'll call it a, a NIC very often in this class as well, a network interface card, NIC. Um, so we want to identify which NIC we want to send it to. We designate the destination MAC address of that NIC card at the beginning of our frame. So those two layers, the physical and data link layer, are here at the OSI model. The rest of these layers, network transport session presentation and application, are all part of your network operating system. So Windows or Apple, um, OS 10 in, in the Mac environment, uh, Linux, they all are going to contain these components of the OSI model and the various protocols that operate at these layers. Um, you'll also notice that uh, there's some uh, different uh, user application components that are listed here for each of the layers. You should become familiar with what each of those are. Um, also be familiar with the data format at each layer. So when the data is being packaged and getting ready to, to send it off onto the network, it starts out as the message and then it becomes a segment and then it becomes a packet. Then the packets are encapsulated in frames. The frames then are converted to electrical signals or optical signals in the forms of bits and those are then what actually get sent out onto the media that is connected to your network card. Now there's uh, a couple of ways that have been used, uh, mnemonics that have been used to help beginners, those that are first learning the OSI model, how to memorize these seven layers here. Uh, one mnemonic works from the top down, from the seventh layer down, and the other mnemonic works from the bottom up, the first layer up. So our first mnemonic to help you to remember each of these seven layers here is all people seem to need data processing. So the beginning layer, beginning letter of each word here represents the layer of the OSI model. So if you can remember this, all people seem to need data processing. In the beginning, that'll help you to start memorizing the order and the names of each of these seven layers here. So that's a top-down mnemonic. We also have one that works from the bottom up. And that mnemonic is please do not throw sausage pizza away. So again, the first letter represents each of the layers here from the bottom up. Please do not throw sausage pizza away. So that's your very first step in learning the OSI model, learning all the names of the layers and learning the order that they occur because they're always the same and so you need to know the physical layer is always the first, the data link layer is always the second, and so on and so forth. So again, this is going to be a skills exam that you'll be taking later on in the class and there's a lot to start learning about the OSI model so start here, start memorizing the names of the layers, the orders of the layers and you'll be off to a good start. So again, here is a graphic that represents the OSI model at seven layers. Um, in fact, this whole uh, graphic that you see here is also available to you on Blackboard. If you go to the resources link, you'll see a link on the resources page for the OSI model. And once you open this graphic up, it's a really it's a web page, and you're able to click down on each of the layers and, and get then a description of what the um, purpose is of that particular layer. Now, in addition to the OSI uh, model, one of the other models that we look at is the Internet, or also known as the DOD for Department of Defense model, because they're the ones that developed the Internet originally. And the DOD model, or the Internet model, reorganizes the OSI model slightly. So what you'll see here is that in the DOD model, there's only four total layers. And we use this quite a bit when we're troubleshooting TCP IP networks because TCP IP is the predominant um, protocol suite that's used within the Internet. And so for troubleshooting, many times it's easier just to, to think of these four layers here.
So you'll need to start also knowing what these four layers are and how they map to the OSI model. So you'll notice the application and presentation layer and the top portion of the session layer are part of the DOD or the Internet model's application layer. Bottom half of session layer and the transport layer are part of the DOD's transport, also known as host to host, but generally I refer to it as the transport layer. And then um, the next layer, the internet layer, is the top part of the network layer in the OSI. And then the last layer, the network access layer, is the bottom part of the network layer, the data link layer, and the physical layer. So this graphic in the lines, the way they line up, are specifically uh, aligned in, that, in this format uh, because there is some overlap between these components in the OSI model and, and these layers in the, the internet model. Be aware of that. Again, know your data formats. Know what the name is um, for each of these layers here. So know that it's message and streams when it's at the top three layers, basically, when it gets to the transport layer, segments, uh, datagrams for the network layer, and then frames for the data link and, and physical layer. And then these are not all of them, but these are many of the protocols that uh, operate at these various layers. And so, again, you'll notice the protocols are mapped to the internet model here, the DOD model, and that's because these protocols all come from the TCP IP suite. And so again, the TCP IP suite and the DOD model are very much connected to each other. Um, but if I ask you what protocols operate at the application layer, in both cases here, you see it would be these protocols that are listed. Um, as far as what protocols operate at the transport layer, again, these two from the OSI and the uh, DOD would be the TCP and UDP network layer or internetwork layer. I believe on the exam it uh, just says the network layer. It's going to be these protocols, IP, ICMP, ARP. And uh, there won't be any protocols listed for the data link or the physical layer. As this slide says, network analysts literally talk in terms of the OSI model. So anytime that you're in the IT field, you will start thinking and speaking in terms of the OSI model. We'll uh, talk about a router being a layer 3 device because it processes IP addresses and it forwards uh, network packets. Um, we'll talk about switches being layer 2 devices. And so that's something you want to start getting familiar with and as again you go through and, and get familiar with all of the uh, components as well as the terminology that's used for each of these layers at the OSI layers and at the DOD layers um, you'll get a lot more comfortable with it. I, what I encourage you to do is start trying to explain what you're learning in this class to other people to your spouse, to your siblings, to your kids if they'll <laughs> listen to you um, because the more that you do that, then the better you will become at doing it. Um, when we troubleshoot network problems, we always start with the physical layer first and work our way up the OSI model. So physical layer means check and make sure that the network cable is plugged in. Um, move it up to the network layer, make sure it's got the right IP address assigned to it. And so this is something, again, that you're going to need to start practicing, start getting used to. I'm going to show you a, um, a little application that we use later on called the IP config application, uh, which helps us to, to troubleshoot networking connections. And uh, we'll be talking about what's going on at the different layers in, in that particular um, exercise as well. Another benefit of the OSI model is it allows for discussion about the interconnection of two different networks or two different computers in common terms without dealing with the proprietary vendor jargon that's used. So in other words, it's not Microsoft specific, it's not Linux specific, it's not Mac specific um, because again, it's, this is an open standard and so it's generic to all of these different operating systems and, and uh, components, routers and switches and whatnot that we use out there. So now we're going to go through each of the layers and kind of give you a, a brief overview of what's going on in each layer. Um, again, if you go to that graphic that I had mentioned to you, if you uh, go to Blackboard, click on Resources, and then click on the OSI model, and then you click on each of the 
layers within the OSI model in that graphic, then you're going to get the uh, definitions. In fact, I think there's more detail on the graphic than there are here in the slides. So at the physical layer, it's responsible for the establishment, the maintenance, and the termination of all physical connections between communicating devices. The physical layer is the one responsible for transmitting and receiving streams of bits. So that's going to be electrical pulses, uh, optical pulses. And there is no data recognition at the physical layer. In other words, the physical layer doesn't know that there's a, a MAC address that's in the stream of bits. It doesn't know that there's a message or a file being uh, open for Word in this uh, stream of bits. It's just simply a stream of bits at the physical layer. There is no comprehension by the device as to what the meaning of any of these bits are. That doesn't start occurring until the next layer up, the data link layer. So at the data link layer, it's responsible for providing protocols that deliver reliable point-to-point -point connections. It organizes that stream of bits that we just talked about into structured frames, which adds addressing and error checking information. In fact, that's pretty much all that is going on at the data link layer, is that it's encapsulating all of the data information in a header and a trailer. So in the header is where we find the destination MAC address, where we're sending it to, and the source MAC address, where it's coming from. And then at the trailer is where we find the error checking information. The uh, data link layer protocols provide for error detection, error notification, and error recovery. Again, the data link layer is a component of the network card itself. So the data link layer frames that we were just discussing are actually built within the network interface card. Again, remember that's also known as a NIC, Network Interface Card, NIC, or NIC. And so uh, it's installed in a computer according to the predetermined frame layout particular to the network, whether it's an Ethernet architecture or a token ring architecture. So that network interface card is going to be designed to work on a particular type of network, Ethernet, token ring, ARCnet, whatever it may be. And that framing then is determined by which type of network you're operating on. Uh, network interface cards are given a unique address in a format determined by their network architecture. That's the MAC address that we were talking about. And these addresses are usually assigned and pre-programmed by the NIC manufacturer. So when you buy an Intel network card, the MAC address is already burned in onto the network card. In fact, uh, the um, MAC address itself is divided into halves. Remember, it's 12 digits, 12 hexadecimal digits. And the first six digits represent the manufacturer. And the remaining six digits then are, are uniquely generated values that... Uh, you know, they had this automated system at uh, Intel or whoever's building the, building the uh, network card that uh, just randomly generates the last six characters and adds that to their signature. And they, there's numerous six-digit signatures for each manufacturer. So here's one of those standard bodies that we were talking about. Uh, the IEEE deals a lot with the physical components in the networking environment and data communications. And so IEEE has this committee that is called the 802 Committee. And it got its name because they first met in February of 1980. So since then, they have continually had um, you know, meetings that we were talking about earlier, if you remember back to the standards development process. So they've developed numerous standards that adhere, that uh, define the networking process. And so when we talk about uh, 802.2 and 802.3 and 802.5, these are all specifications or standards that were developed by IEEE that relate to networking. So specifically, 802.2 is, um, is, is a protocol, a standard, that is representing that split that we saw in the data link layer. So again, the data link layer is split into two sub-layers. 
802.2 represents the top portion of the MAC sublayer called the LLC or logical link control sublayer. At the bottom portion, you're going to find a lot of other standards in there. 802.3 represents Ethernet. Um, 802.5 represents token ring. And so if you actually do a search on the Internet for the, 80, the IEEE 802 standards, you'll see that there's a, a lot of different standards, 802.1 all the way up through uh, 802.20, I think, is the last one I saw. And so those are all networking uh, standards that have been developed by IEEE. So specifically with networking, you're going to find that the LLC, the top layer, the top sub-layer of the data link layer is IEEE 802.2. That actually translates from whatever physical architecture we're working within, the Ethernet token ring, um, up to the next layer up, um, which is the, <coughs> the networking layer. And so it will translate to uh, IPX or it'll translate to IP or, or whatever protocols are, are being used at the network layer. And again, the MAC layer, depending on which network architecture, remember that's where the addressing comes from. So if we're in an 802.3, which is an Ethernet architecture, then you're going to have that 12-digit hexadecimal value that uh, is used for addressing frames in an Ethernet network. So this is defining specifically the LLC, the 802.2 sublayer of the MAC uh, layer 2 of the OSI model. It uh, again splitting the data link layer into two sublayers offers transparency to the upper layers, the network layer and above, while allowing for the MAC sublayer protocol to vary independently. So in other words, we can have TCP/IP or IP at the uh, network layer, we can have it operate on an Ethernet network, we can have it operate on a token ring network, on an ARCnet network, and all these underlying network architectures, and those can be completely independent of these upper layer protocols. So that's a big advantage because you don't have to have specific protocols that only work with certain networks. You get a lot more flexibility that way. Uh, so this allows a given network operating system to run equally well over a variety of different network architectures as embodied in the network interface cards. So if you think about it, and you're using TCP IP at your home, and then that travels over the uh, Internet, which is also a TCP IP based network, and then eventually gets to your corporate network, it could be internally at the corporation that they're running IPX, SPX as their network protocol. Well, it won't matter because it can get, get translated to that protocol at the network layer and then their architecture may be different too. You have probably Ethernet at home, they might be using token ring uh, in your network at work. And so all that stuff can be translated and, and interchanged completely independent of each other and, and you know, obviously it gives us a lot of flexibility as far as networking is concerned. We don't have one specific protocol tied to one specific architecture. So the third layer is a very important layer of the OSI model. It's the network layer. These protocols are responsible for the establishment, maintenance, and termination of end-to-end -end network links. So at the data link layer, it's responsible, um, the data link and the physical layer, responsible for point-to-point -point links, meaning each hop of the journey. Uh, if you can just picture your computer going through several routers to get to a web server, say at Microsoft, then each router you hit along your journey, that's your point-to-point -point connections, uh, whereas the end-to-end -end connection would be you, the requesting device, you know, your laptop or your home desktop computer where you've got your uh, browser open, your web browser, and you're trying to find a web page. You're the requesting device, so you're one end of the communication, and then the web server at Microsoft would be the other end of the communication, so that's end-to-end -end communications. So again, the network layer is responsible for identifying the beginning and the end of the communication, whereas the data link and the physical layers are responsible for each individual hop along the way to get from the beginning to the end. So as far as the addressing is concerned, remember that MAC address, that's only identifying the next network interface that we have to forward the message to. So there's a lot of network interfaces that we forward the message to until it gets to the end of its journey. The, say, IP address working at the network layer, 
that's going to identify where we're sending from and where it's got to get to. Think of that like sending um, a letter in the mail. And you've got a return address on there, and you've got the address that you're sending the letter to. So that's the end-to-end -end that would operate at the network layer. That addressing information is actually being placed where it's coming from, where it's going to, the starting point and the ending point. That's actually all happening there at the network layer, and in most cases probably using IP addressing. Uh, network layer protocols are required when computers that are not physically connected to the same LAN must communicate. So if we just simply were all connected to the same switch, which that's how we define a LAN essentially, is just simply connecting devices to the same switch, if uh, that were the case, we wouldn't need the network layer because there would only be one interface, um, whether it be multiple interfaces on the network, but there wouldn't be uh, multiple interfaces in between the starting point and the ending point. There would simply be the sending interface and there would be the receiving interface since we're all attached to the same box. That's what a switch is. It's just a way of connecting all these interfaces so that they can communicate with each other. So in that case, all you need is a data link layer address, a MAC address. Um, but when you hook that box, that switch, to another device called a router, then you're actually sending messages off of your LAN, your local area network, to somebody else's local area network over the the wide area network, which we know uh, one, one way of saying that is the internet, although there's a lot of different wide area networks. A lot of companies have their own private wide area networks, but the internet is a public wide area network that most of us use. And so that the Internet does is connect a bunch of local area networks really all together using routers. And so for us to get from our local area network to another local area network, then we have to have a network layer addressing process that's going on, a protocol that's going to take care of that for us. So network layer protocols are responsible for providing network layer end-to-end -end addressing schemes and for enabling inter-network routing of network layer data packets. So important for you to understand that concept again between network layer addressing, meaning the start and the end, identifies the start of the message and the end of the message, uh, compared to data link layer addressing or MAC addressing, where we're just simply identifying each hop, each interface that it's being forwarded to as it goes along its journey. And then from a terminology standpoint, we usually use the term packets uh, when we're talking about the network layer protocols and the way that it puts its information together. Um, so if we're talking about the message and, and it's getting packaged at the network layer, then at that point in time it's called a packet, whereas uh, at the next layer down, the data link layer, we call it a frame. So again, try to get that terminology sorted out in your head as well. Packets means network layer doesn't have any data link layer, doesn't have any framing added to it yet, uh, but once we take it from the network layer and we pass it down to the data link layer and the data link layer adds its header and adds its trailer and now we get a frame, then we convert it to electricity or light and then we send it out onto the network. Above the network layer, layer 4 is the transport layer and its protocols are responsible for providing reliability for the end-to-end -end network layer connections. Transport layer protocols provide end-to-end -end error recovery and flow control. So as two devices are communicating with each other, if one device is sending messages faster than the receiving device can process them, the receiving device will send back uh, uh, some information, a, a short little message that says slow down, basically. And so that provides for the flow control between the two devices. And then error recovery deals with the fact that, again, we're going over vast distances in many cases to get from point A to point B and uh, there are times when frames get corrupted or get lost and so we have to have the ability to recover from that and so that's what error recovery is all about and that happens at the transport layer. Transport layer protocols also provide mechanisms for sequentially organizing multiple network layer packets into a coherent message. So what you'll note is that um, at the network layer, we have to divide up the messages many times into smaller chunks because we are limited by the size of a message we can put on any particular network. Uh, 
and usually the messages are much larger than that that maximum size called the MTU maximum transmission unit so many times the message is larger than that maximum transmission unit which is limited by the network architecture and so we break it up into into smaller packets and so we can uh, identify the order that those packets go back together again and so that's uh, the sequential aspect of uh, organizing those packets and above the transport layer layer 5 is the session layer its protocols are responsible for establishing maintaining terminating sessions between user application programs uh, for instance uh, if you're using Outlook as your email client and you're connecting to a mail server like uh, Microsoft's Exchange server um, there's a whole session that has to be established uh, for the communication of the data back and forth between the Outlook client and the mail server and so the session layer protocols are responsible for establishing maintaining terminating those sessions uh, sessions are interactive dialogues between network computers and are of particular importance to distributed compu computing applications in what we call a client-server environment. So a lot of things that we do these days are client-server based, meaning you have a piece of software, an application that runs on your end, that's the client, and it communicates with another piece of software running on a server somewhere, and so that's the server end. Uh, Mail is a good example. Outlook and Exchange. Outlook's the client. Exchange is the server. Um, uh, browsing the internet is a good example. Your your web browser is a client, and the web server then is the server component. And so there's a lot of that that goes on out there. Client-server environment. The presentation layer is layer six. Its protocols provide an interface between user applications and various presentation related services required by both of those applications a good example is data encryption and decryption these protocols are considered presentation layer protocols and also protocols that translate between encoding schemes such as ASCII to EBCDIC you won't find EBCDIC out there much anymore that's an old IBM encoding scheme uh, pretty much predominantly these days um, what we use is Unicode um, just to kind of quickly introduce you to the concept here what we're talking about is the fact that each uh, letter on your keyboard is actually represented by a numeric value so that when you press a, a letter on the keyboard then that gets translated into a numeric value that the computer can then process and so ASCII is just one way of identifying those letters and EBCDIC is another way of identifying those letters completely different schemes because IBM is very proprietary and so EBCDIC was uh, you know exclusively used in the IBM environment whereas ASCII is an open standard and so most computer operating systems support ASCII so the original ASCII was uh, seven bits meaning that it used seven bits to identify each of the characters on the keyboard which meant that we were limited to 128 characters. That's two to the seventh power. Remember, a bit is an is a electrical state of either on or off, and so that's a power of two, right? It can be on, it can be off. That's two different possibilities. So two to the seventh power. If we have seven bits, we're saying we're, what we're trying to communicate is we have two to the seventh power, which is 128 bits. Uh, I should say uh, 100. Well, yeah, 128 bits or 128 let me take that back <laughs> seven bits 128 possibilities those are actual permutations if you take two to the seventh power you can actually align seven bits and take all the permutations of zeros and ones that you could possibly have with seven bits and there'd be 128 different combinations so um, with the original ASCII you can only represent 128 different characters or keys on a keyboard then they came out with ANSI which was an eight bit standard so now you have two to the eighth power or 256 possible combinations meaning we can now represent 256 different keys on a keyboard still wasn't enough for some of the Asian languages which have thousands of characters and so we now use Unicode which is a 16 bit or 65,536 possible characters that can be represented 
So Unicode is the standard uh, method of encoding that we have these days. But the point is that if we're using an old ASCII or ANSI or EPSIDIC uh, application, then we still would be able to support that because it can be translated from one format to the other, one of these older formats to Unicode more than likely, uh, and that could be done at the presentation layer. And finally, we get to the seventh layer, the application layer. One of the misnomers about the application layer is that this is where your programs reside, and that's not the case at all. So don't confuse this with, the f with thinking that uh, this is where Word is, or this is where Excel is operating, or Photoshop. That's not what we're talking about here. This is actually where we have what are called APIs, or Application Programming Interfaces. So this is actually the software that interfaces between Photoshop or interfaces between Word or any of your programs that are running on your computer. It provides an interface between those programs and the network interface. So those programs need to go find files on the network or your web browser needs to go out and find a web page. So the web browser is a program. It uses an API to package its request. When you type in the web address you want to go to, that information needs to be packaged into a message and sent out through your network card out onto the internet and so there's an API then that will handle that job for your web browser. When you take Photoshop and you try and go get a file on your network there's an API that will format that request to get the file or to go look for the file um, and all those APIs are operating at the application layer. So there's all kinds of APIs or utilities as this slide says uh, that are network-based services and support and user application programs. So this layer is not the programs themselves. This is that interface or utility or API, however you want to say it there, that uh, is the, the packager, so to speak, the assistant, the service that uh, helps your application programs, your Photoshop, your Word, do some sort of network-based operation which is an advantage to the programmers because see now the programmers don't have to write all this sophisticated networking processing and network services into their programs. The program can simply call on existing network services that are built into the operating system. The examples that they give in this slide here are uh, some OSI protocols, the X.400 and the X.500 standards, uh, which we really don't deal with much in this course. They're pretty old protocols. They're used in the old X.25 networks. Um, but they still exist out there. Uh, you might find a question on this chapter's quiz, but I don't think that uh, you'd ever deal with them in the, in the real world anymore. Uh, DNS is also another API that is working at the application layer. Uh, DNS is the Internet Telephone Book, and so anytime that you're l typing in, again, an address in your web browser, that actually has to be translated to an IP address, the network layer address. And so what the DNS uh, is designed to do is to receive your browser's request to go to a particular web server and translate that then into an IP address so that your computer can then use the IP address to make that end-to-end -end communication that we talked about earlier. And so anyway, DNS is just another one of the many APIs that are operating at the application layer. now. That's from the client side. There is such a thing as a DNS server that it actually is the phone book that we're sending these requests to. Now, that's, that's a whole different issue. That is an actual server program that runs on a server. Um, but in this case, we're talking about the ability for your computer to resolve a name into a specific IP address. So again, it's considered to be an API or an application layer protocol. And the last slide in this chapter deals with the top-down approach for ISD or information systems development. We have another course called CSIS 201, which is a systems analysis course, and it deals um, a lot more in, in a lot greater detail uh, with uh, systems analysis and, analysis and the development of systems. But this kind of gives you a broad overview. Um, basically, systems development consists of two pieces of the puzzle. One is processes, which is the software that uh, is written, and then we have the people who are somehow involved in the building of the software and the uh, 
uh, analysis of what the business needs are and things of that nature. So that's what this graphic represents. The, the pink areas are a representation of the business processes, uh, like business operation, business management. Those would all be pieces of software. And then the white areas <coughs> are the human components, the human resources. So the business analysts then would be the ones that are responsible to help develop the business management systems. Uh, also do the business analysis of what our information system needs are. And then you can see below the information systems development is the systems analyst, the uh, database analyst, the technology analyst, and the network analyst. And they're all involved again. Um, between those two processes there, the developing of the information systems up above as well as down below the application development, the database development, technology assessments, and also the network development.